So let's go back into the past. And again, I want to look at population, because population tells us a lot of things. So I'm going to show you the curve of population over the last 16,000 years. I'll just, before I do that, let me just mention, I'm, I'm using the before current era terminology, which is the same thing as BC. And the, the year is one down there, because historians have year 1 AD and 1 BC, but they don't have year zero, and that messes up astronomers who need. Anyway, we're not at a level of detail where that's going to matter much. So here's the, here's the world population. This is based on uh, US Census gathering up the best um, uh, sort of academic estimates for all this. So here's what it looks like. And to give you some markers in here, this is where farming first started. This is the first cities. This is where Rome was at a peak. And this is the Renaissance. There's that business as usual carrying capacity. So in looking over all of this history, one of the things that I found to be really helpful is something I call the outline of history that's made up of three cultural system domains. Now, this is why I had to talk about water and ice and you know, steam. Because we've gone through, and we, will, we are in the process of going through big cultural transitions. We're in the midst of a transition now that is as big as the shift out of honey and gathering and into agriculture and cities. But we don't see it because we're in it. But we will see it tonight. You get the chance to be like a historian from 300 years in the future when all of this is obvious. I describe these three periods as tribal, empire, and planetary. It's planetary, by the way, not global, because global is an abstract idea. Planetary is real. And it's, it's not about going off to other planets. It's about the fact that we are all on one. So this, the first transition starts with farming and goes to cities. The second transition starts with the Renaissance. And we don't know quite where it ends. We're not at the end yet. We're still in the later parts of it. But I think that we are at a point where what we do is going to be hugely impactful. I just want to point back and say that, that I first published about this back almost 30 years ago, back when I wasn't quite sure what to call the third period. However, what I grew up with, and what I suspect many of you grew up with, was this notion that at some point writing happened, and history is everything after when writing started, and before that was something called prehistory. Right? Any of you have that in schooling? And I suspect that that's what most people have in their minds as they kind of think about all this. However, I also want to acknowledge that there are um, certainly have been a, a fair number of folks saying, look, we're re really moving into something really different now. And so uh, talking about some sort of new age and the past. There are also historians that have looked at this big stretch. Uh, and I want to refer to the work of, of David Christian, an introduction to big history. And he talks about Paleolithic, agrarian, and modern. But he finds he really has to split the agrarian. So he has kinship-based and state-based. So it gets a little complicated. However, if you draw lines down through all these, you'll see that they line up really quite nicely. And that isn't just because I put this slide together to make it line up nicely. <laughs> really, when people try to take a big picture look at how history has gone, these tend to be the really big breakpoints that people look, look at. However, most people look at them simply as breakpoints and don't have the sense of domains and transitions between the domains. OK, 
So I want to focus on three particular qualities as we move through the different domains. Now these are not the only qualities, but they're pretty important qualities. We could have had more, but these will do. So there's main livelihood. What is the main livelihood in the culture? What is the basis for social organization? And what's the communications level of development? That's a little awkward phrase, but I think you'll see as, as the examples come along. So in the tribal, the main livelihood was hunting and gathering, some form of foraging. In fact, it was basically, that was it. The basis for social organization was kinship. And communication was orality, that is stories and voice and everything that you could do with speech. In the empire era, the main livelihood is agriculture. And the basis for social organization in the empire period is violence enforced, religiously sanctioned hierarchy. Now, I don't mean to, to beat up on religion in that, because religion is a very broad concept that comes in all kinds of different ways. But the important thing is that in every one of these empires, there was always some religion there that provided the justification for why it was that they had the hierarchy that they did. And so you had the soldiers and the priests operating from two different directions, making sure that the hierarchy stayed in place. And it contributed a certain amount of social stability and other things, but it's essentially the way it worked. And then elite literacy. Um, Writing was really important, but it didn't spread beyond essentially about 10% of the population. How about the planetary era? Well, that's the question. That's what we're doing. We're trying to fill in what those qualities will be as we move into the planetary era. So how are we going to do that? How do we discern the future? And I think one of the things that we need to recognize is that we're not, as humans, we're not very good at discerning the future. It's really hard for us to imagine beyond our own, own domain. And I want to give you some examples. For instance, imagine you were part of a hunting and gathering band. And all of a sudden, this thought floated through your mind of, of cities and writing and all of that. It would be totally bizarre to you. You, you, you know, what is that? You'd have no reference point for understanding it. Then think in 1500. You may recognize her. You may recognize her from the posters. If she was trying to understand even what our life is like today, <laughs> it would just be bizarre. She really wouldn't know um, how to, she wouldn't have any points of reference for understanding the stuff that goes on already, and we're not really even yet into the full planetary era. So we need some strategy. We need something that can help us to look beyond the, uh, or at least look across this empire to planetary transition. And the strategy that I'm using is to, first of all, look for analogies in nature. And that's what that pioneer and succession species piece was all about, because that provides a really interesting analogy for us to look at. And then also for us to try to explore deep history in terms of system domains, in the same spirit that if we can understand history from that perspective, just as by understanding atomic physics, you can understand ice, water, and steam. So that's what we're headed for. So the way we're going to proceed is we're going to start by looking at the first transition and try to understand what are its big characteristics. Then we'll look briefly at the empire era. Then we'll move on to the empire planetary transition as it's gone so far. And then we'll move to the planetary era. So tribal to empire transition. So we're moving from hunting and gathering to agriculture, from kinship to violence enforced hierarchy, from orality to elite literacy. How, do, how did that happen? Let's focus first on the main livelihood. 
For this, it's helpful to understand that there were certain parts of the world that had a lot of potentially domesticatable species. They had readiness. And those areas, particularly this area in the Middle East called the hilly flanks, but also over here in what's now China and in Middle America. Um, almost all of the domesticated species actually were, their, their earlier precursors were in those areas. So that's where the readiness was. But, and, and hilly flanks, you first get it in 11,000 BCE and then China and the uh, Middle America around 8,000 BCE. The trigger that set it off was climate change. As we came out of the previous ice age and things warmed up, this is from this is sort of a blend from ice cores to give you a global proxy. There was this spike that was sometimes called the golden age of hunting and gathering. And settlements started to appear because of the way that there was enough food that people didn't have to be nomadic all the time. In the hilly flanks, some of those settlements began experimenting with some of the grains around them and got far enough along so that even when the temperatures went back down again, you had domesticated grains showing up in the archaeological record. In the, in the other, in the China and Middle America, it didn't happen until it, it really got warm again. So what happens with this? Let's look now in a little more system sense. There's an irreversible transition that happens to agriculture. Settlement and farming go together. They very much support each other. I guess I've got to get them together. Um, you need settlements for farming to happen, and you need farming to be able to keep settlements going most of the time, although here in the Pacific Northwest, we had settlements based on the enormous richness of uh, what could be caught from the ocean. Anyway. Farming enables you to capture more kilocalories, more energy per person and per land area. That combined with the way that in settlements, the women who are having children are not walking around all the time, and in fact, it's easier to have children. And so you get population growth out of this. The two of these lead to higher population density. After all, that's what a settlement is all about. Together, the population growth and the higher population density lead to over-exploitation of the wild plants and animals. So you're hunting and gathering, you over-exploit it. And because of that, people lost the skills of hunting and gathering. And when you combine all those things, the higher population density, the over-exploitation, and the de-skilling, you reach a point where it becomes essentially, I won't say impossible, but very hard. If you, if you were to turn back, you would do so with huge population declines. So people don't do it. So this transition is initiated by climate change and maintained by the increased energy per capita and energy per land area. OK, social organization. And here I'm going to draw on another historian, Ian Morris. His social development index went back and researched a whole lot of really interesting cultural things. One of them was to look at what's the largest settlement size as time moves along. And with the first farming, it was way down here, just a few hundred in the settlements. And it gradually grew and grew up to the first cities, which were around 8,000 people or so. But something happens to the social dynamics along here. Down when it's less than 1,000 people, and especially when it's less than 500, you know people. You know them personally. It's, it's all kinship and individuality. But above about 1,000 people, the, no, the brain can no longer keep track. And so you begin to get into abstractions, categorization, and people did that with clans. And as the clans evolved, the archaeological record shows that the clans began to differentiate among themselves. 
and some clans had fancier burials than other clans. Uh, it becomes more hierarchical. There's another factor that comes in here, and that is this is the energy capture per person. Start from here up to the first cities, it goes up, in fact, by a factor of 2.2, and doubling the energy that you're capturing is actually quite a bit. And it opens up a whole lot of interesting new possibilities. More energy captured per person winds up meaning more division of labor is possible, because then not everybody has to be farming. It also means you have more storable and stealable goods. This was a big part of the change to settlements, was that you started to accumulate stuff. And then you started to see your neighbor was accumulating stuff, and eh, that was kind of interesting stuff that your neighbor was accumulating. So with all of this, there was more motivation for raids. That in turn, with more division of labor and more motivation for raids, made, led us to better weapons and um, fighters. There's more intergroup conflict, and you see this in the archaeological record. The early farming settlements had no fortifications around them at all. As time goes on, they get to be more and more. So more militarization of communities. Until it really crests by the time you get to cities. And there's a wonderful piece. This is from the city of Ur. So this is after cities have started. This is something called the Standard of Ur. And, I'm gonna, and it's got two sides to it. And this is a mosaic that shows a battle down here with the chariots running over the enemy and soldiers up here gathering up enemy prisoners and then bringing them to the king, the one who is the biggest. And uh, the details here, the, sold, the, the prisoners are naked, and you can see the slashes on their legs. They're totally humiliated. This is from about uh, 4,500 years ago. Let's put it that way. The other side shows that uh, you could call this, sometimes they call it the peace side. I won't quite call it the peace side. What you have down here are sort of faceless people carrying heavy loads of goods. Here you have a kind of middle range of people leading um, livestock. And up here you have the king again, breaking out through the top of the uh, picture with various other figures seated and drinking. There's a very clear hierarchical class structure here. The empire era hierarchy, it penetrated into all aspects of culture. Adults over children, men over women, powerful men and women over others, humans over nature, mind and spirit over the body, and sky gods over everything. And it's a legacy that's still very powerfully with us. All right, the third one. What happened with communications? Actually, it was numbers and accounting that seemed to be the original impetus for the development of language. But it also required enough division of labor, enough concentration of people. So it, it came only with the first cities. You would not have a sole scribe all by themselves because who would read what they were writing? You needed to have multiple scribes, which meant that you needed to have enough people, concentrated enough, to make it worth doing. And the record keeping enabled a big shift in what the new civilizations could do, because it was, it was the co essential complement to military force. Before that, you could go out and raid, and you could steal, and you could run protection rackets, but you really couldn't manage the areas that you had briefly conquered. Once you get writing, you can keep accounts, and, you, and bureaucracy emerges, and um, so the whole basis for successful empire emerge. If we look at this transition and the timing in the transition, 
The shift to agriculture really happens earlier in the period, but it, as we saw, drives other shifts. And so then you get the shift from kinship to hierarchy, and it's only at the last part that you get the shift to literacy. Before that, it's pure tribal domain. And at the end of it, it's pure empire domain. But during it, it's a kind of rolling transition where every new shift moves you into another not quite stable place. So what are some of the lessons that we can draw from this? First of all, the driving forces are gradual and unobtrusive. I want to say that the things that shape History and culture are not the same as what makes news. And that's a lesson to apply now. Small changes can grow to irreversibility. Changes in one part of the system can destabilize other parts. And it's powered by positive feedback loops that will go until they somehow the system gets to a place where it's now in a new stable configuration. However, kinship and hunting and gathering and orality never fully go away. And I want to illustrate that this way. So there you have the tribal era with hunting, gathering, kinship, and orality. And as the transition to the empire era happens, it, it looks like this. Something called kinship is still there, but it's no longer the defining thing. In the tribal era, best as we can tell, kinship was applied to other species. It was applied to understanding grandmother earth and grandfather uh, sky. It was applied in many, many different ways. When you move into the empire era, its territory gets narrowed. You now have this other thing called class besides just kinship. And the same is true with orality and with hunting and gathering.